Survival of the fittest means that the weak and disabled are nothing but useless eaters which should be put down for the betterment of our species. Resultingly, evolution is responsible for some of the greatest atrocities in modern history. In fact, the Nazis actually used evolution to justify the Holocaust. What evolutionists try to avoid is the fact that Darwin was a racist, which is obvious when just reading the title, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Pres preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Why would these supposed scientists accept such a nasty philosophy? I had to investigate. The concept of evolution was not originally proposed by Darwin. The idea of a species descending from another has been pondered since at least ancient Greece, but began developing much faster with the advent of the modern scientific method. The biological sciences were slow to embrace this methodology until creationist Carolus Linnaeus attempted to discover the biblical kinds and developed the Linnaean classification system showing a nested hierarchy of clades within clades of organisms grouped by their obvious similarities. The question was what mechanism was responsible for the variances within each clade. In 1809, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that the variances were directly attributable to the behavior of organisms within their lifetimes, resulting in very slight changes which were then passed on to their offspring. For example, an animal might wish to reach leaves or fruit in a tree. It stretches its neck in an attempt to reach the top of the tree, resulting in a slightly longer neck which it passes on. Over time, successive generations develop longer and longer necks until eventually the descendants of this population might resemble a giraffe. This explanation seemed fairly intuitive and remained the best explanation for the variety of life until 1858 when Alfred Russell Wallace presented a paper titled On the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type jointly with an abstract by Charles Darwin at the meeting of the Linnaean Society. The mechanism proposed by Wallace and Darwin became known as natural selection. In this model, the variety variety of life was explained by the overall fitness of an organism as inherited from its precursors. Those which were more fit tended to reproduce more often, thereby passing on their fit genes at a greater rate. In 1864, economist Herbert Spencer read Darwin's work and drew parallels between biology and the economics of free market capitalism. He suggested the term survival of the fittest to mean better design for an immediate local environment. That year, Darwin introduced the term in the third edition of Origin of Species. In the biological view, a fit individual is one that is able to produce offspring that, in turn, produce offspring. An unfit individual is one that is unable to produce viable offspring. There is nothing in this concept which prescribes genocide. It's a fact of biology. Organisms just happen to be more inclined to reproduce with healthier and more able individuals. So then, what is a favored race as described by Darwin? The word race comes from French, which was borrowed from the Italian word rasa which literally translates as species. So no, the term didn't originate as a synonym for ethnicity. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Going back into antiquity, the term also referred to all descendants of a particular common ancestor. Also, there were people arguing that the different ethnicities and cultures were actually different species than humans. The time in which Darwin lived saw all three uses of the word in practice. This is actually something he acknowledged in his typically verbose fashion in The Descent of Man. It is not my intention here to describe the several so-called races of men, but I am about to inquire what is the value of the differences between them under a classificatory point of view and how they originated. Even a slight degree of sterility between any two forms when first crossed or in their offspring is generally considered as a decisive test of their specific distinctness and their continued persistence without blending within the same area is usually usually accepted as sufficient evidence either of some degree of mutual sterility or in the case of animals of some mutual repugnance to pairing. With this statement, Darwin acknowledged the multiple uses of the term race, but made sure to clarify that he was using the term to mean species. This doesn't mean that he wasn't what we'd call racist today. He most likely was, but his use of the term in his work was the biological definition referring to reproductive viability. Any other use is not applying the word as Darwin proposed 
closed it. It is a common practice in a debate to answer any mention of Hitler or Nazis by citing Godwin's Law. As an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazism or Hitler approaches one. In more recent traditions, the mere fulfilling of this law means the discussion is over, you have conceded and excused yourself from any reasonable conversation. The difference here is that evolution isn't being compared to Hitler or Nazism. The actual creationist claim is that it was a tool or even the cause of Hitler and Nazism. The German people under Hitler had no way of knowing any of Darwin's views because Darwin's origin of species was actually banned in Nazi Germany via Section 6 of the 1935 Law on Forbidden Books under the listing writings of a philosophical and social nature whose content deals with the false scientific enlightenment of primitive Darwinism and monism. It has been argued that this ban refers specifically to combining Darwin and Heckel's work. In other words, they were banning what they felt was the wrong view of Darwinism. This might seem like a reasonable argument, but it falls apart upon examination. Darwin's view was that humanity was essentially a species of animal. Heckel's view was that humanity was separate from and superior to the animal kingdom. So in reality, Heckel's work was indeed the preferred view of evolution under the Nazis, who favored Aristogenesis, a concept which proposed that evolution had some sort of goal to create higher and higher forms of intelligence and physical prowess. Expressing this in Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote, If nature does not wish that the weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one. Because in such a case, all her efforts throughout hundreds of thousands of years to establish an evolutionary higher state of being may thus be rendered futile. Hitler's genocide was an implementation of artificial selection, which actually goes against the principle of random mutation and natural selection, which are blind processes and the very basis of Darwinism. Compounding this was the idea he held that Jews were inferior, non-human beings due to their own behavioral choices, which is actually Lamarck's mechanisms, not Darwin's. In reality, Hitler did not accept the theory of common descent at all. As he said in a table talk, from where do we get the right to believe that man was not from the very beginning what he is today? A glance in nature shows us that changes and developments happen in the realm of plants and animals, but nowhere do we see inside a kind a development of the size of the leap that man must have made if he supposedly has advanced from an ape-like condition to what he is. When the Nazis began exterminating the Jewish population, they were killing individuals individuals with the ability to produce viable offspring. This necessarily violates the concept of survival of the fittest. The reality of Adolf Hitler's views is that he used every tool necessary to support his cause. It wasn't just misrepresenting science. In fact, he chose to focus more on Christianity. For example, he wrote in Mein Kampf, the anti-Semitism of the new movement was based on religious ideas instead of racial knowledge. The best characterization is provided by the product of this religious education, the Jew himself. His life is only of this world, and his spirit is inwardly as alien to true Christianity as his nature 2,000 years previous was to the great founder of the new doctrine. Of course, the latter made no secret of his attitude toward the Jewish people, and when necessary, he even took the whip to drive from the temple of the Lord this adversary of all humanity, who then, as always, saw in religion nothing but an instrument for his business existence. If we're going to conclude that Hitler applied Darwinian concepts, then we all also have to conclude that he applied Christian concepts. Or we could just agree that he twisted anything he could toward his own purposes. In the end, evolution makes no suggestions whatsoever about morality other than to acknowledge that some behavior benefits the overall fitness of the species, and some does not. Whether we choose to contribute to the benefit of our species is our own decision. Knowing why we make that decision is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.